not this month, um, change anything. So, just. I'm, uh, I'm excited. This, uh, this is an exciting week for us because uh, the book came out on Monday, and so here I am. Uh, you get it first, and uh, it's exciting to be here to share this with you. I have uh, big ambitions for the next 18 minutes. We'll have time to relax and talk after that. But I want to change your brain. So I want you to have a brand new brain 18 minutes from now. We're going to have to work hard to make that happen. You're going to need two things. You're going to need a piece of paper or something to write on. Electronic would be fine, too. Uh, you're also going to need a buddy. So if you can find a reasonably intelligent person at your table and pair up with them, I'm going to get you to work here right away. So pairs are preferable, twosomes are good. Uh, if there's an odd number at the table, a threesome is okay also. But here's, a, here's the first question. For the last 25 years, we've been studying human behavior, how people change, what kind of behaviors make a difference in producing results, and that inevitably led us to write the book that we've just finished after about a four-year study that I'll share a little bit about uh, uh, in, in just a moment. But the, the central premise of what I want to share with you tonight revolves around this idea, the idea of human agency. So by show of hands, how many of you believe that you have tremendous control over your own behavior? How many of us believe that? So pretty much everybody. Um, my job tonight is going to be to convince you that you don't. <laughs> so that's the premise. What I want you to understand is how remarkably little control you have over your behavior. Now here's, uh, here's the first thing I'll do to try to move us that direction. We've, we've studied uh, HR uh, policies and practices in organizations, how we try to improve performance, and found many stories like Thomas. Thomas is a real person was part of the study we've been doing for the past four years. Thomas was an incredibly loyal employee. He was described by his colleagues as the kind of person that you would want to have shoulder to shoulder with you in a crisis. But his colleagues would also privately whisper to you that you couldn't really rely on him when there wasn't a crisis. He didn't manage to schedule particularly well. So as happens in organizations, he had a new supervisor. And in year one, his new supervisor decided she was going to address this issue with him. So she gave him a little feedback. She said, you're going to have to learn to manage, create a schedule, be predictable. And he was as good as his word for about a week. And in year two, she brought the issue up again. She said, you really need to learn to manage, or you're going to lose your job. So that becomes really important for him to change. In year three, he lost his job. So this was a three-year-long train wreck. It was a very slow one. And it was baffling to us because Thomas wanted to keep his job. And he believed he would lose his job if he didn't change. So what we ask ourselves is if there's this thing called agency, if we really have the capacity to control our behavior, why does that happen? And here's another. Here's Jim, again, a real person. Jim had his second heart attack. After his first heart attack, his doctor gave him some very heartfelt advice. His doctor said you need to change some of your habits, your diet in particular where you're going to die. Now, how many of you think that would be a significant motivator? Yeah. It seems that it would, and he did change his diet for about a month. And then he fell off the wagon, and then he had a second heart attack. So, so this ought to make us curious. With an incredible amount of motivation to change, to keep my job or to keep my life, why is it that we don't? Well, the first point here is that we're horrible at this. And it shows up in every domain of our lives. 87% of employees, I won't ask us to, to, to raise our hands on this one, but 87% of employees have suffered economically because they weren't behaving in ways that their employer, boss, or others wanted them to. You know, fewer than one in five of us are prepared for retirement the way we'd like to be. Did you hear what I said? It's the way we'd like to be. We want us to behave in certain ways, but we don't behave in those ways to produce the results we want. Relationships are the same. So all of us have the ideal of sustained long-term love. You know? We don't like to be in a relationship with someone that we can have trust and memories and all sorts of great things with. But few of us can get ourselves to behave in ways that produce that. And finally, to my friend Jim, 90% of those getting coronary bypass surgery, just as one evidence of our inability to behave in ways that produce health, are back to the same behavior that got them on the operating table within two years. So we believe we have agency. We think we have the capacity to control our own behavior, but then you see that. 
And I hope it makes us scratch our heads. So here's what we want, want to define as the problem that you and I are trying to address. The one that affects performance in organizations, that affects us in teams, relationships, our health, our finances, is this. It's situations where we know we should change. In fact, we even want to change. To a degree, we'd like to, but we don't change. Now that's the conundrum that we've been trying to figure our way through for the past 25 years. Why does that exist? Why is that the case? In spite of our, our brave belief in our capacity to control our behavior. So starting about four years ago, we decided to focus exclusively on this question. We threw out to the universe a question, are there people out there that are struggling to change some habit in their lives? Well, 5,000 people raised their hands at me. <laughs> it was not hard to find subjects. And then we said, tell us about your story. Let's follow the narrative. Let's follow the experience. And as we did, we found 4,400 failure stories. So 4,400 of these 5,000 who said, I was trying to lose weight, trying to improve my career, trying to improve my finances, and I'm still trying. And it's still not working. But there were about 600 that were successes of various degrees. And those are the ones we particularly wanted to understand. So here's the, here's the important finding I want to share with you in our limited time tonight. There were three principles that had tremendous explanatory power in which of those two groups you fell into, the 600 successes or the 4,400 not yet successes. There were three principles that explain success to a remarkable degree. I'm going to talk about one of them tonight, but first I need you to help me sort of prepare to share one of them with you. So this is me, this is from Facebook. Uh, last night, uh, my doctor tells me I should eat about 2,000 calories a day. Yesterday, I ate 5,286. I ended up passed out on the floor of my hotel room with an inverted tub of Ben and Jerry's on my face. And I need you to help me figure out why. So I want you to write down on your piece of paper or write down on your electronic instrument one reason why. Why would Joseph overshoot his intention by such a colossal amount? Ten seconds. Top of the head, first thing that comes to mind. What's one reason? All right, we got one. Somebody call one out from this table over here. What's one reason? Yes. Okay, no motivation. What's another one over here? Short term. It was a short term kind of, yeah, I, I just wanted the, the hit from the chocolate, right? Well, but one here. Immediate gratification. Immediate gratification, and one over here. Stress out. It feels good. Now, I want you to notice the theme. So when we, off the top of our heads, try to explain that kind of behavior, it tends to rely exclusively on an explanation related to, to willpower. We tend to say Joseph didn't want it badly enough. Or what he did want was something different. It was all about my motivation. So here's the, the point. As we study these change attempts, we tried then to simulate the dominant failure story. And we tried to use uh, really pricey computer modeling to illustrate people's typical path for change. So here's the model. <laughs> How many of you identify? <laughs> so we won't play that out, right? And what, what change often feels like is this Herculean attempt to oppose our own will, right? We, we have these short-term impulses, and we've got to fight those, and we can eventually get to this good habit domain, but then if we relax for just a second, we get dragged back in to the bad habit territory. So here's the, the big takeaway that I want you to get tonight. What we learned from 5,000 narratives of change is this, that the problem is not what we think it is. The problem is not willpower. The problem is not that we're weak. The problem is that we're outnumbered. So this is the model. It isn't that one. It's not just us, us with the rope pulling against ourselves. It's us pulling against a finite number of incredibly powerful forces that we tend to be blind to. The problem is not that we lack will. The problem is that we're blind and outnumbered. There are more forces opposing the new behavior than supporting the new behavior. And to the degree you and I are blind to them, we tend to blame the only source of influence we can recognize, which is us. It was me. I didn't want it badly enough. Well, having studied 5,000 attempts at change, I can tell you that most of the 5,000 wanted to change. Knew they should change, but didn't change. So the finding here is this. You and I have far less control over our behavior than we like to think. We like to think that I'm, I'm 
captain of my destiny, right? A master of my fate, when in fact we're not. But what we can do that puts us in control is learn how to do this. What those who succeeded at change eventually learned how to do is control the sources of influence that control them. That's where the control needs to happen. It's not controlling me. It's learning to reshape these various sources of influence that are subtly shaping my behavior. So that's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about how do you get them from that side of the road to my side of the road? How do I shift them so that they're auguring towards the change I want to create rather than against it? Now what I'm going to do is fly you over these quickly, and my purpose in the next few minutes is just to show you how blind we are to the many things that shape us, subtle, small, little things that have a, an incredibly powerful effect on what we do. Here's the first. We tend to be blind to the degree to which our personal motivation, so even the thing that we depend on so much that we think we're in control of, your personal motivations are far less under your control than you think. Let me just illustrate it in one way. So I want you with your buddy to do a, a little task here. I want you to imagine you're playing what behavioral economists call the ultimatum game. So I've given you $10, you and your partner, so you need to decide who is person A and B between the two of you. Ready, set, go. <laughs> okay, all of person A's, raise your hand, raise your hand to person A. Okay, person A, you are going to make an offer to person B. So you have $10, you make the offer, Person B can then either accept or reject the offer. So what you're offering is how you'll split the $10. So you could offer five and five. You could offer nine for you and one for the other person. You can offer anything you want. Okay, make an offer and then person B, you can accept or reject it. If you reject it, neither of you get anything. If you accept it, then you get whatever part you were given of the $10. Does everyone understand? Okay, ready, set, go. Person A, make the offer now. <laughs> All right, person B, accept or reject. Thank you. One way or another. All right. Now let me ask you very quickly: How many of you offered five dollars? How many of you did that? Yeah. How many of you were hoping for a ride home? <laughs> Now, we all have different motivations in this. So, so this is the experiment that Lee Ross designed. Uh, Lee Ross from Stanford here locally that illustrated a really important point. So we did a replication of this at a mall on a Saturday. We had people come and participate in the experiment. Some were told that this contest was called, or this game was called, the Wall Street game. And they were told that they would have a chance to make an offer of from zero to ten dollars to their opponent who would accept or reject their offer. So Wall Street game opponent. We then did a second round in which we called it the community game. And we said, you will make an offer to your partner. Do you think that would make a difference? Yes. Now, isn't it weird that we think it would? Just two words, Wall Street or community, right? Partner or opponent. It's just little words like that change our motivation, change our frame. We found that 60% more people offered an even split when we called it the community game and told them it was their partner. Now, what does this have to do with our struggles to change? Well, as we studied people who were trying to change, we found a woman by the name of Sharman Wendt who said, I was trying to lose 120 pounds. This was an enormous challenge for her. She'd been trying for 20 years to try every attempt and diet she could ever find, and none of them had ever produced any lasting results for her. She said, but then I finally turned the corner. One of the things she did that helped her turn the corner was this. She said, I learned from my past experience that if I made outrageous promises to myself, I would fail. So she said, this time I never promised that I would always keep my diet. I didn't say that because I didn't want to feel like a failure. Instead, what I promised to do was before I broke my diet, I would read my three by five card and then I'd make a choice. That's all she did, so that was her promise, was a three by five card. Now I want you to think to yourself, could we actually affect how we felt about a choice in the moment? Could we affect our personal motivation with something as little as a card? So she said her biggest weakness was chimichangas. 
She said she'd be at a restaurant and she'd see chimichanga on the, rest, uh, on the menu and all of these kind of programmed biological responses would begin. She'd imagine melted cheese and she could imagine the warm, moist pork inside and she could imagine biting into this and her salivary glands would start to go and her ears going too. <laughs> So she said as she would sit there and she'd face this moment, she would retrieve this card and she would read the first line on it, which she had prepared. The card said, I would like to feel healthier. And she would pause and think about that for just a minute. And then she'd read the second line and would say, I'd like to wait like the way I look in the mirror. And then she'd pause and she'd think about that. And then I'd like to have more physical stamina. And I'd like to model healthy living for my grandchildren. I'd like my husband to be proud of how I look. She said sometime between line four and line five on the card, she would start to feel differently about the chimichanga. Does that make sense? Now notice what she's doing. She realized how little control she had over her own behavior, so she started creating little tricks, little methods to intervene in her own behavior as though she were a lab rat and a scientist simultaneously. She's trying to figure out her own behavior and think about how to influence it in a positive way. So, when I asked her how this worked, she said this among all of the other sources of influence she used made a difference. She lost 120 pounds, has kept it off now for about five years. Just remarkable progress, but one of the big turning points for her was her recognition that just changing a few words in her head could dramatically change how she felt. And most of us don't recognize that. But here's the second. It isn't just that we're far less in control of our motivations that we think, than we think. It's also that we tend to grossly underestimate the degree to which skills matter. That skill makes a big difference in our capacity to change our own behavior. What we found by studying these 5,000 people, particularly folks like Michael Vitale here, who was a 20-year drug addict and alcoholic, he literally lost everything in his life. He lost his family, he lost his wealth, he lost his job, he lost the person he thought he was going to marry. Over the course of 20 years, there were many, many times when Michael knew he should change, wanted to change, and didn't change. And so, what we learned as we started to go through Michael's story is that in order for him to sustain a life of drug addiction and alcoholism, he had to acquire skills does that make sense? There are an enormous number of skills. Now, had we time, it's interesting to kind of sort through some of those. He had to be a world-class liar. He had to learn to steal. He had to learn to access drugs, to mix them appropriately. He had to learn pricing models. He had to learn a whole host of things. And what happens with any bad habit is we acquire skills in those bad habits. Whether it's bad, uh, doing a bad job at work, or whether it's not getting along in a relationship, we develop idiosyncrasies, habits, skills that actually reinforce this over time. So what I'd ask you to think about is if you were giving advice to Michael about how to change, what advice would you offer? And to the degree that advice does not involve acquiring a whole different skill set, he'll fail. Now one of the skills that he would inevitably need to master is a skill of controlling his impulses, right? Now, I'm using words very carefully here. I'm calling it a skill. Most of us wouldn't address it that way. We talk about the ability to control impulses often as a motivation issue. Am I committed enough? Do I want it? How many of you are familiar with the, the marshmallow experiment experiment Walter, Walter Michel did 40 years ago? Fascinating study. He brought four-year-old kids into a laboratory setting, and he put them in front of a marshmallow for about 15 minutes. And his question was, were there children that could wait 15 minutes if they were promised a second marshmallow? Well, he found that very few could. <laughs> Most of them caved in, but there were about a third, uh, between a fourth and a third, depending on the, the group, who uh, were able to wait the 15 minutes. He followed them then for about 20 years and found their lives were entirely different than the others. Now, what he didn't do at the time, what Albert Bandura came along and did later, was ask the question, what's different about those kids that could control it? Is it just a motivation issue? <coughs> well, Albert Bandura guided us in designing this experiment. We brought a whole second cohort of kids in, and we gave them three pieces of advice. We said, if you'd like to wait 
for the second marshmallow. You don't have to if you don't want to, but if you'd like to, here's some things you might try. We taught them some skills. And I want you to see if you can spot the skills in action. Here's the second group. <laughs> you see a skill. <laughs> don't look at it. Now look what she does. Sort of novel. She starts a little game <laughs> with her belly. <laughs> Incredibly inventive. This one is very clever. She says, I'll change my location. <laughs> a little bit of advice. <laughs> this young man looks behind the curtain. <laughs> Just entirely distracted from it. What Bandura realized was that there were skills involved with delaying gratification. And if you and I don't address the skill gaps when we're trying to help people change behavior, we have a whole source of influence that's working against us. But let's continue. There are six sources of influence that you saw on the rope that pull against us that sustain our bad habits. The next two we call social influence. It turns out that bad habits are almost always a team sport. I want you to notice, when I asked you why Joseph ate 5,286 calories, almost nobody's automatic impulse was to say because of who Joseph had lunch with. Very few of us look at the social context within which these behaviors happen. We know that if you eat lunch with one other person, you eat about 25% more. There are social influences that shape your choices. If you have dinner with six or more people, you eat about 70% more than if you were to eat alone. Now, when I say that and we start thinking about it, you start going, yeah, that's probably true, right? It slows the meal down, and so I'm sitting at the table longer, so I'll eat a little bit longer. And I'm but when you and I are trying to understand why we don't change, we rarely look at that problem. Well, here's a little illustration of it. We did a study where we asked men, do you wash your hands when you use a public restroom? Look at the number. So 95% of men say, yes, I do. Now, first of all, we found out that 45% of them were lying. <laughs> it's interesting that even in just a little social contact in a public setting, if you ask somebody a socially desirable question, they'll be willing to lie to you. They'd be willing to say, yes, I do, when they really don't. Now, maybe they're not self-aware. But then we went into the bathroom and put an out-of-order sign on a stall, uh, put our feet up on, uh, on, on the toilet so that nobody was aware that somebody else was in the, the bathroom, and then tested what affects whether or not people wash their hands. What we found is that only half wash their hands if they're alone, but guess what happens if there's one other person in the restroom? The compliance rate moves up 50%. <coughs> this is a human being you will never see again. But we're so worried that we might not give a favorable impression that we'll actually stop and wash our hands just to impress that stranger who's probably talking on his cell phone anyway, right? So we, we tend to be incredibly motivated by, by social forces, incredibly enabled by social forces, but when we create a change plan, we're blind to that. We don't engage that. The last two that we absolutely have to address are structural forces. The physical structure that we inhabit creates incentives for us or enables certain behaviors. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine for just a moment that I have handed you a $100 bill. So you've got $100. Everybody got it? Okay, think of what you're going to do with the hundred dollars. What are you going to do with it? What would you spend it on? You know, would it, would it be a meal or an outfit or what would you like the hundred dollars for? So own it. Now I'm going to make you an offer. I will trade you a cashier's check for some amount if you'll surrender that hundred dollars to me. The cashier's check is dated one year from today, so you won't get the money for a year to, from a, uh, to, until a year from today, but you will get it. It's absolutely assured you'll get it. So I want you to think, what is the least amount that cashier's check can be for for you to surrender the $100 cash? How much do I have to give you? $200, how much for you? $105, interesting, okay, I'll take yours. How about yours? About $500, what's the least I can give you? $150. $150, now I want you to think for a minute about these numbers. If we average it out, Typically, people will average about $200 that they're going to want. How many of you are getting 100% return on your IRAs right now? <laughs> You've surrendered your cash to the IRA for, what's the return you're getting? 1%. Yeah, 1% maybe. But you're going to require $100 extra, $400 extra, $200 extra for me to give you a cashier's check right now with exactly the same guarantee. Why? What does that teach us about human nature? What we know is, 
that the pleasure of bad habits are here and now, and the costs of bad habits are far off into the future. What we know about human beings is that, hu that future rewards and punishments don't motivate much. The fact that I might have another coronary bypass two years from now does not affect whether or not I eat a chimichanga in this moment very much at all. This is one of the, the problems with human beings. Future incentives and future punishments don't affect our behavior. So what do you have to learn how to do? What you have to learn how to do is to bring the rewards and the costs forward. The changers that succeeded in our studies almost always did. They would create short-term rewards or short-term punishments that they would impose on themselves. Ironically, sometimes they're very small. Charmin said that one of the things she would do is every time she'd go down a dress size, she would get herself a new outfit. After a while, it would take a couple of months to go down a dress size. But that one reward would be so incredibly motivating to her because it brought the, the rewards in closer. Now think to yourself how irrational this is. She's taking her own money and buying herself an outfit and telling herself she just won. <laughs> but it feels good and it works because we're thinking about this sort of as though we have to influence ourselves. The last source of influence is structural ability. You and I, last of all, tend to be blind to the powerful role our environment plays in shaping our choices. Look at this one for a second. So, do you see the irony in the picture there? And I'm going to stand on a treadmill for the next hour, right? But is this Photoshop? Interestingly, no, this is, this is the real deal. Interestingly, probably most of the people walking up the escalator don't catch the irony. We don't realize that our environment is shaping our behavior in ways that just don't make sense. So let's one last time go back to Jim who had a third heart attack. Not just the second, but the third. I want you to imagine Jim comes to you and says, I need advice. I need to change my habits. How? Now, what would you advise him? Would you advise him to do something to increase his personal motivation or to increase his personal ability? Would you perhaps say get some social support? Would you say get some friends? Would you say create some incentives or rewards? All of these are important for us to address. All of these get those powerful forces on our side. But none of them is the easiest way that we could immediately change our behavior. We did a study inspired by Brian Wansink of Cornell University. Brought a bunch of kids together, had them run around and play soccer for about an hour and a half so they were good and hungry and tired. Brought them in, split them into two groups, seven at one table, seven at another table. The seven at one table were given fairly large plates. Look at the plates at the second table. So their plates were quite modest. All of the men were given the same macaroni and cheese, same spoon, same everything, and told, fill yourself up. Eat as much as you want until you feel absolutely satisfied. At the conclusion, we then weighed the two bowls to see which children had eaten more. Which would you guess? Yeah, yeah, we think about that now. But when you're trying to give me advice about how to lose weight, we rarely look at this. The kids with the larger plates reported being just as satisfied as the ones with the smaller plates, but ate 73% more than the ones with the smaller plates, equally satisfied. One of the most potent things we can do to shape our own behavior is change our physical environment. Just change things that give us cues or enable positive behavior. The willpower trap is the, the most pernicious thing that gets in our way when we're attempting to change. The willpower trap is the belief that the best predictor of our capacity to change is our own commitment to it. It turns out that that has almost no predictive value. What does predict is our ability to get the sources of influence on our side. It's to shift them from opposition to support. When that happens, the odds of success go up tenfold. The odds of success go up ten times. So, as we published this in the, in the MIT Sloan Journal about three years ago from a study uh, at that point of about a thousand people's attempts at change, we were struck with how incredibly powerful just that one principle was. Learning to get past our blindness, the fact that we're outnumbered by these sources of influence and learn to consciously move them on our side was one of the most important things we could do to try to change. Thank you very much. Was that 18 minutes? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Question. So, yeah, now we can. Uh, we